Let me answer the burning question on your mind. Yes, Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled is great. In fact, it's better than great, it's addicting. But where's the fun in just stopping there? I'm going to go super in depth into everything. How the controls work, the evolution of the tracks, the online, the future of the game, and much more. I'll also have set timestamps for each section of the video in the description and the comments, so if there's a part you want to specifically see, you can skip to it. But I would very much appreciate if you watch the whole video. Leave a like, subscribe, comment, share the video around, it'll really help out the channel. Anyway, yeah, this is gonna be a really long one, so grab some popcorn, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Crash Team Racing's 20th anniversary is coming up, and this is the best way to celebrate it. But what is Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled? It's a kart racing game, a remake of the PS1 classic, beautifully remastered by Beanox with an online mode including everything from the original game, plus more, and includes all the tracks and battle arenas from the PS2 racing game, Crash Nitro Kart. The original Crash Team Racing is one of the greatest kart racers of all time, and you would hope that the remake would try to capture the feel of what made the original great, right? And it does, sort of. Depending on who you are, your history with the Crash Racers, and what you want out of this game, you'll get a different experience. At least at first, and I can't stress that bit enough. If you grew up playing Crash Nitro Kart, this game is a lot faster, a lot tighter to control, and it might be a bit of a learning curve adjusting to the speed. If you played Crash Tag Team Racing, this game is nothing like that. Tag Team Racing was trying to do its own thing, so you'll basically be learning a brand new control scheme. If you grew up with Crash Team Racing but haven't played in a while, it'll be like meeting an old friend. Beautiful nostalgia will kick in and it will feel exactly the same as last time. If you've never played a Crash Racing game, the controls may take time to master and you might struggle a bit on the adventure mode and will lose a lot against the experienced players online. But don't worry, I'll explain how it all works in a bit. You may have noticed I have left a very important group out. That's right, the mobile games. This controls exactly the same as Crash Nitro Kart 3D on the mo- no, Okay, no, I'm joking. I'm talking about those of us who have played Crash Team Racing recently and or speedrun the game. Now, there's no denying that this game feels great, but it is different from the original. I'm not a speedrunner and I don't know every technical term, so I can't dig deep into every ludicrously fast mechanic. Please don't murder me in the comments for that but I do know some of the technical stuff and can beat all the Oxide Ghosts in under 55 minutes on the original, so I can give some insight into what's different, and more importantly, why it's different. And hey, some of the changes are for the best, and others aren't, but we'll get to that later. Let's talk about the controls. Crash Team Racing goes with the mentality of easy to play, tough to master, and as such has a rough difficulty level for beginners but I'm going to teach you the basics and then throw you into the extreme deep end and teach you some deadly moves that will leave your online rivals quaking in their carts. Unfortunately, as a side effect of the intense racing, you will physically move the controller as if it will improve the way you turn, and you will press down on the buttons harder when things get hectic. You will have to suffer this fate like the rest of us. Oh, and a side note, I'm going to be talking about the PS4 controller, since that's the version I know. The game is also out on Xbox One and Nintendo Switch for the time being, and as such, will have different controls for obvious reasons. Just bear that in mind as I describe things. Like most karting games, the controls are pretty simple. You accelerate with X, brake with square, fire weapons with circle, and drift by holding R1 or L1, depending on your preference. But playing that way is not enough. Not nearly enough. There is also an alternate control scheme to accelerate with R2 and drift with L1 or X, but I find that way too confusing, so I'll be sticking with the original controls. Experiment with both if you're having trouble though. At the beginning of each race, you can rev up the engine. You can see the little meter turning red. If it's in the red when the race begins, you get a little boost. If you keep revving at a good time to the lights changing, the boost will be greater by the time the race begins. But the timing is hard to master. Practice makes perfect. At this point, I should probably mention the different classes. There are currently 26 different characters, with many more to be added over the coming months as free DLC, but each character falls into one of four distinct classes. Each character of their class has the same exact stats, the changes are merely cosmetic. To explain, I'll just use one character for each. Each class is measured by three different stats, speed, turning and acceleration. Crash is the middle ground, he has equal for all three. Polar has extreme turning, but poor speed, Dingadal has maximum speed, but poor turning, and Coco has maximum acceleration, close to middle turning, and middle speed. I personally prefer maining Coco and that class of characters, because the acceleration helps you get in front immediately with the trick I told you before, and getting into first quickly online is really beneficial. Besides, speed isn't the most important trait, but we'll get into that in a bit. But that will be why you see me playing as Coco a lot in this video. 
but experiment with all of them and work out which you prefer. No specific type is flawed, any can win. It's all down to your skill as the driver that determines victory, and a little luck can't hurt as well. Next, let's talk about hopping and turbo drifting. These are how you win, and with practice you will become infinitely better at the game. When you hold R1 or L1 based on preference, you can enter into a drift when turning, but you can also tap the button to do little hops. These hops are incredibly valuable when it comes to either dodging items in the way, or to help you reach new heights, or even take tight turns. Combine this with drifting and you can take any turn in the game, but it will take a lot of practice and you need to get the right angle for some of the tighter turns. I mentioned that the hop can help you reach new heights, and it's true. If you hop off a ramp or a cliff or something, when you land you get a boost, but you can also use it to reach many shortcuts throughout various tracks. Now let's talk about the more challenging technique, drift boosting. Take a look at the bar on the bottom right. If you're drifting with R1, when that bar goes into the red, if you tap L1 you get a little boost, with 3 boosts maximum per drift. The further along that bar you wait until you tap L1, the more boost you get out of it. This is an ingenious system which makes this kart racer the fastest of them all, but it's hard to get really good at. Fortunately, there are 3 different ways to see this boost. If you tap triangle you can see the boost meter is different, there's a classic one used on the PS1, then there's an updated version of it with a rev counter, and also this new one that Beanox have made to make it easier to tell when to time the tapping of L1. I personally prefer the original one though, and I'll make a request to Beanox right now. The classic one has the end of the meter going into the centre of the screen, whereas the new one has a build up of the red sliding into the side of the screen. When I was training to get good, I was looking purely at the meter for timing and using my peripheral vision to see what I'm doing on the track. Because I'm looking at the end of the meter, which is close to me driving, it made it easier to look at both at once. Now I'm looking at two things that are really far apart with the new system. Beanox, please can you add a version of the new one which is mirrored, because it's really elegant and helpful for learning the timing, but hard to manage two things at once, at least for me. When it comes to playing this game, I personally find using the D-pad as opposed to the analog stick much easier, but when training with drifting, use the D-pad in multiple ways to learn what you can manage. Maybe hold the opposite direction once you've entered into a drift. You can create a surprising amount of control by resisting fully drifting in one direction. In any case, I would personally recommend four tracks for training this. Number one, Coco Park. The track is wide and if you do all of these on time trial, you have no AI or hazards to get in your way. Just learn how to perfect it on your own time without worry. Number two, Slide Coliseum. Not a difficult track, but has a bunch of tight turns in both directions, so you can learn to boost, hop jump to do tight turns, and also hop over the tyres for shortcuts. It's called Slide Coliseum for a reason, you know. Number three, Turbo Track. Same as Coco Park, but there are a bunch of speed boosters scattered around, so you'll have to learn to maintain your boost and maintain it at great speed. Also, you'll need to learn to brake with square on some of the extreme turns. And on that note, don't be afraid to do a handbrake turn if you feel drifting or hopping isn't enough. It can stop you quickly and help you get out of some dangerous situations. Finally, number four, Android Alley. I think this is a really fun track, but it's also pretty wide for the most part. There's a couple of complicated turns, but it's a nice wide track to learn drifting in a more complicated environment. If you're a complete beginner, these in my opinion are the easiest places to learn new skills, and I have no doubt you'll become a master in no time. Maybe try Ruse Tubes too, it's a very fun track. But that is the easy stuff out of the way, let's get technical. A grander boost can be gained from the speed pads you'll find dotted around the various tracks. You'll notice your flame is much larger when you hit it. However, if you maintain the drift shortly after hitting the speed pad without the flame decreasing, each new drift will produce a bigger turbo as you're maintaining the flame. The flame is the biggest indicator that you've done it right. Android Alley is a good way to practice maintaining this boost, as the track is wide at points and there's a fair few speed pads. You can also keep this boost if you create a boost from a jump off a ramp. It doesn't have to be a big ramp, just as long as there's some kind of jumping surface and you land from a higher point than normal, you'll create a boost. Oh boy, I have the confusing job of teaching you about USF, otherwise known as Ultimate Sacred Fire. Yes, that's its actual name. Very few boost pads in the game will produce a blue flame. You'll know it's happened because a sparkle will reflect off your cart. You can't miss it. Also, you know, the flame will be blue. If you master drifting with this active, your speed will be so incredibly fast. If you know how to maintain it, as long as you don't hit any walls, you'll keep that boost and be unstoppable. If you jump off the boost ramp, sometimes you'll run out of USF before you hit the ground, or you'll land it and not have enough time to create a drift boost to maintain it. 
I recommend going into the ramp whilst drifting to create the boost before you land, and it will be easier to keep it going. The best place to land this is probably Turbo Track or Tiny Temple. Every boost pad in this level is an ultimate sacred fire boost pad. Learning how to maintain the boost and also controlling your cart whilst doing so is important. But baby steps, work with the smaller drifts on the other tracks first. Finally, I will teach you to the best of my limited ability how to do full 180 degree turning without losing speed. If there's a tight turn like the ones on Turbo Track or Cortex Castle, or one of my favourite turns on Electron Avenue, either mid jump or on the ground, let go of the acceleration button and hold R1, square, and the down directional for whichever way you're turning. The majority of them will be down and right. If you do it right, you can turn the corner without losing speed. You can even do it in midair. However, sometimes it doesn't move the cart. Sometimes you just turn around in midair as you plummet in the direction you were heading. Because you've let go of acceleration, if you hit the acceleration button in midair, you get a boost of speed in midair heading towards the new direction you're facing. I know, it's complicated and I have no idea if I've explained that in a way that makes sense, but just look at the screen and the examples that I've got for you. It shows you how it works. It's incredibly tough to master and requires incredibly quick reactions because you don't know if you've nailed the turn until the turn happens, but this is the best way to turn corners fast. Hopefully that makes sense. But there you have it. Those are all the movement techniques and it only took me around 2,100 words. Yeah. Now I want to talk about the differences from the original game's movement, but this part won't take long. First off, whilst the two games look similar, this is slightly deceptive. There are differences, albeit minor. The cart is naturally slower, but not by much. A second at most per lap. However, you can absolutely go way faster on some tracks. In terms of turning, it's not quite as tight, and that's due to how the hop isn't quite as effective. It's a tad more floaty, and that means you can't hop as many times as you used to be able to. There are also a couple of subtle changes when you come out of a drift. You sort of slide a little at the end of the boost, and it's different to adjust to especially if you're used to the original. But as I said in the beginning, the game will feel weird at first, but you can adjust after an hour or two. It took me a couple hours, but I'm not as good as others at the game. Finally, let's talk about Ultimate Sacred Fire. This has changed significantly in the best way. Before, once you used it, you couldn't jump out of the boost until you hit the ground, and then you would hop to maintain it. Any additional boost created would cancel it out. Now, the opposite happens. Once you see that blue flame, keep drifting and keep that flame going. In tracks like Tiny Temple, for Oxide's Ghost, you need to use Ultimate Sacred Fire for two full laps. So this goes to show you the level of how fast you can go. It's brilliant. There are a couple of other differences, and not really for the better, but they're more track-specific things, so I'll get to them when I talk about the tracks. There are a ton of different crates placed on the track during a race. There's the Wumper Crates, which give you Wumper Fruit. If you collect 10 of them, your speed increases and your weapons will become more powerful. But be warned, take damage from a weapon and you'll lose some Wumper Fruit. And then there's the Weapon Crates. The weapons in this game have quite the range. Let's go through them. The Bomb! Once an act of terrorism is now a glorified deadly bowling ball. You get 1-3 to three bombs, which go in the direction you're facing. You can throw them backwards by holding back on the D-pad or analog stick, and you can also remotely detonate them next to someone if it won't hit them by pressing the fire button again. When upgraded with Wampa Fruit, it has a bigger blast radius and also homes in a little. The green beaker bottle potion thing can be placed on the track for someone to hit and spin out. You can also fling this forward by holding forward when you throw it. Its upgrade turns it red, and when hit, you spin out, move slower for a bit, and you can't fire your weapon. You also get a little rain cloud over your head, and all your rivals might want to hug you, because things are clearly not going right in your life. A TNT can be placed behind you. If you land on it, you have 3 seconds to jump, I think, 5 times to get rid of it. If not, you explode! However, beware of people with it on their head. If they get rid of it, it could fly backwards and hit you. The upgraded version of it is a Nitro Crate, which simply causes you to crash out. Realistically, you would actually die. Don't play with dynamite or nitroglycerin. The homing rocket goes for the person in front of you. This can be avoided by going around a corner, causing it to miss you. Sometimes erratic movement can also cause it to miss, but that's not too common. You can get one to three rockets at a time, and the upgraded version just makes it faster. Speaking of faster, there's the power boost. It literally gives you a boost of speed, not the drug. The upgraded version just lasts a little longer. Again, not the drug. Aku Aku, or Uka Uka, depending on what character you're driving as, shows up to make you go faster. 
They also allow you to not get slowed down by different terrain, which is handy for cutting corners, and they also make you invincible. Drive into your rivals to take them out. The upgraded version just lasts longer. The shield will protect you from anything, however it runs out if you hit something or after a certain time limit, like 10 seconds or something. You can also throw it directly in front of you to hit your rivals. The upgraded version makes the shield blue and it never runs out until you're either hit or you throw it. The orb goes straight for first place, wherever they may be. However, it can also hit others along the way. If you're really far ahead when you're playing online, you will almost certainly see at least four of these. And finally, the clock. This spins everyone out and everyone drives slower for a small period of time, apart from the person who used it. When racing online, this will clock block every experienced player and stop their ultimate sacred fire speed streak. And I think that right there teaches you everything about the weapons and mechanics. That took a while, but let's finally get to the meat of the game. Oh, wait, no, sorry, uh, can't. Game's gotta load 30 seconds. It's apparently a minute or so on the Switch. Give me a sec. A little more. A little more. Okay, there we go. The game forces you to start with adventure mode, and you're greeted with two options. Classic mode, where you have the option to choose one of eight characters, and you stick with them to the end. No switching, and the difficulty gradually increases as the game goes on. And nitro fueled mode. You can switch characters and costumes whenever you want, and you have the option to choose easy, medium, or hard difficulty. I'm gonna tell you right now, unless you're extremely good at the game, do not pick hard mode. Don't think, oh yeah, I like a challenge, I can do a- No, you can't. Believe me, hard mode is brutal. Way beyond what anyone was expecting, and I absolutely love it, but oh boy it doesn't mess around. The game's opening cutscene is absolutely beautiful, but that sums up the game as a whole. I mean, you've been watching the footage, the game is gorgeous. When you compare it to the original, as great as it looked at the time, there's just no contest. They've poured so much life into everything, and in my opinion, especially the boss cutscenes. I personally love the Komodo Joe cutscene. They've turned him from an eh, boss in Crash 2 to an epic sinister magic badass, and I would honestly totally be up to seeing him upgraded to a top tier villain. They could do so much with him, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Nitrous Oxide is the fastest racer in the galaxy, and he's ready to challenge the champion of Earth in a race for the planet. If we lose, he'll turn the planet into a giant parking lot and make us his sliver minions. Minions, we, sorry, can't say slaves anymore. The ratings board is watching. Um, can't say farmbling, um, can't say bugger. Uh, so no time to waste, we gotta stop him. Depending on who you play as, you're greeted by someone different. If you're Crash or another good character, Aku Aku will be the tutorial mask. And if you're Cortex or a different bad guy, it'll be Louis Armstrong. Congratulations! You win a trophy! I have no idea what they did to Ukuruka's voice direction, because it's still John DiMaggio who made him menacing in the Insane trilogy, but he just sounds like Louis Armstrong, and I cannot get it out of my head. Oxide, please don't turn Earth into a parking lot. It's a wonderful world! Each hub world has four tracks. Win those races to get the trophies and unlock the boss door. Take down the boss, race for more trophies, rinse and repeat until you face Oxide. Each boss has a different weapon they prioritise and purely send behind them. Ripperoo will fire TNTs at you, Papu Papu potions, Komodo Joe airborne TNTs, Pinstripe sends never ending bombs, and Oxide sends literally everything and the kitchen sink. But once you beat Oxide, he'll challenge you to another race once you collect all his time relics, because he's very bitter about you beating him. If you thought this game was over, oh no, it's only just begun. But hey, you unlock Oxide as a playable character, so that's super cool. I suppose I should talk about the game's biggest fault. I just don't get how broken this AI is. It, when items and things like that are just completely pointless in order to use, and they're not going to help you in the race because the AI is just essentially going to cheat and rubber band. No matter how much distance you put between you, they will eventually make a miraculous comeback. So the end of the race is the only part that really counts. Come on, IGN. But seriously, this game doesn't rubber band. They have said speeds and the AI is really good, but it doesn't rubber band. If it did, I wouldn't be half the track in front of everyone, including the bosses. So, yeah, that's not a fault. The game's just challenging, yo. But really, on that note, I've had friends tell me that they've had trouble on medium difficulty, so the game is actually genuinely challenging. Hopefully, elements of this video has helped you learn different tricks that you didn't know about, though. 
Instead of a fault, I'll actually list a positive. For how much life is poured into each track, this game runs at a stable 30 frames per second. I've not once seen it lag. I'm sure some people would prefer 60 frames, but honestly, it runs really well in 30. So, now Oxide's up to the ante, there's a lot to unravel. You have to collect all 18 time relics, each track has one. You have to beat the track in a set time, and whilst the number is always intimidating at first, there are time crates scattered around. They have the numbers 1 to 3 on it, and that freezes the clock by that number of seconds. If you collect all the crates, you get 10 seconds taken off your final time. So it's definitely worth going for all of them, once you master movement. Each relic challenge has 3 tiers, Sapphire, Gold and Platinum. To beat the game you only need to go for Sapphire, though the final adventure mode percentage does go to 101% if you get all gold relics. Platinum relics are purely for bragging rights, and I guess you also get a cool platinum paint job option once you get them all, but they are no joke, you will suffer. Once you collect 10 relics, a new track called Slide Coliseum opens up for you to take on its relic challenge, and only its relic challenge, at least in adventure mode. Besides that, there's the CTR challenge tokens. You have to face a slightly harder AI, collecting the letters C, T and R that are hidden somewhere on the track, and win the race. I absolutely adore these, they're really fun. The colours of the tokens are red, blue, green and yellow, and they correspond to a gem tournament we'll get to in a minute. On top of that though, there's also the purple tokens. You must collect 20 crystals in the arena in a short amount of time. And if you're on hard mode, when I say short, oh boy, I mean short. You better learn where those crystals are and work out the best route to them, because they don't give you long at all. Once you get all the tokens, you'll find there are gem cups. The tracks in that coloured gem cup are the same as the coloured token for it. Makes sense, right? But what happens with the purple ones? Well, you race against the bosses in a tournament on their home turfs. I love this idea. It's such a cool experience to face the bosses again, but under more fair circumstances. Once you get all the gems, a new track called Turbo Track unlocks, and that'll be the final relic before you can take on Oxide once more. Once you take on Oxide and win once more, you've done it! You beat the game! You also get his hover car as a cart option, which is incredibly cool. Like, that is the dream as a kid when you had the original game. Outside of Adventure Mode, there is plenty to do. For starters, there are 13 other tracks, which are based off of those from Crash Nitro Kart. And I say based because they've changed a fair bit. In the original game, there was an anti-gravity feature, but that's no longer present. Sections of the track have been changed or removed as a result. However, this is not a bad thing. In fact, these tracks are the best they've ever been. In the original game, I never got to appreciate how fun they are due to the original game's mechanics being slow and a bit stiff. Simple shortcuts felt challenging in a way that was frustrating. Now, everything feels smooth, fun, and the levels are really good at teaching you tricks. There are actually Relic and CTR challenges for the Nitro Kart tracks as well, though they don't yield any reward as of right now. They're more just there for you to try should you want to. Though I will say, compared to its Crash Team Racing counterpart, the Nitro Kart Platinum Relics are incredibly easy. The time for Platinum is similar or the same to what it was in the original game, and the original game is much slower, so it's just an absolute cakewalk. Oh, and I genuinely forgot to mention, though literally I'm ad-libbing this in, <laughs> this game has a mirror mode. It's absolutely incredible, and it feels so wrong. The tracks just feel wrong, it's, it's weird. I love it, but it's weird. <laughs> On top of those, you can also race in cups with four races in each, but they don't give you any reward. It's more for fun, especially if you have a friend or three besides you to play along. Oh, I almost forgot! The remastered soundtrack is fantastic! There's a lot of really cool touches, like in Rue's Tubes theme, it uses a submarine sonar as part of the instrumentation, which I think is brilliant. That's not for you, you can switch to the original music in the options menu. Next up, I want to go over the tracks. The good, and sadly, the bad. And speaking of the bad, hey, it's Crash Cove! This game prioritises speed to create height, for the most part. Obviously, how you jump off of a ramp helps, but in this instance, the jump in Crash Cove is terrible. Something that was one of the easiest shortcuts to execute has suddenly become strangely inconsistent, especially if you're going for the Platinum Relic. For that, you'll definitely need to collect every crate, and one of them is just way too high up. The characters just don't want to reach it all the time, it's so strange. You know what else is strange? How Sewer Speedway can turn from being my favourite track to one of my least favourites. 
The shortcut is so damn inconsistent and you will just never reach it. A lot of the time you launch straight into the wall. It's so oddly specific and feels like luck. It's honestly really disappointing, because the track itself looks beautiful. Well, as beautiful as it can be, seeing as it's a sewer. But on top of that, the walls sort of act like a magnet. They push and pull and magnetise you so you can move around them, and it just doesn't feel as smooth as it did in the original game. Though that is something you sort of get used to over time. Finally, on the bad scale, we have Dragon Mines. This segment of tight turns is atrocious now. Originally, you sort of bounced off of the walls, making turning this corner fun but now you stop dead if any part of you touches it. It's just such a shame. What was once a really fun part of a track has made going fast a nightmare. And again, the rest of the track is really fun and beautiful, but it makes it a track to dread now. But those are just a couple of negatives. Let's focus on the positives. The tracks have been so lovingly recreated and you can see that the developers care. The tracks feel identical, but with more included to liven up the place. I think my favourite thing is the CTR at the start finish line on each track. Each one is unique to each track and I love stuff like that. Like in Polar Pass there's a polar bear trying not to fall off. It's so stupidly cute, I love that and I can't emphasise enough how much I love the Crash Nitro Kart tracks. I never hated the game by any means, but when I went back to replay it after learning how to get really good at the original Crash Team Racing, it just wasn't the same. The game feels very heavy and slow and so unfun comparatively. Now that's not a problem. The tracks look so gorgeous and I love the sense of speed you get on a bunch of the tracks, especially Deep Sea Driving and Electron Avenue. And speaking of them, they transformed them gorgeously. Deep Sea Driving's boring speed tunnel has become ramps over a kraken and Electron Avenue has become my new aesthetic. What a beautiful track to behold. On top of that, the game has a ton of references scattered throughout for those of us who care about that sort of thing. Cortex makes a reference to Twin Sanity. I'm an evil scientist. What did you expect? Oxide, when losing, considers taking up the unicycle. Unicycling sounds fun. Penta Penguin says, Penguin, you won! <laughs> that wasn't actually that bad. He says that as a reference to the unfinished line that was in the original game. Yay, Penguin, I won! And there's a bunch of costumes and references to things from the past. Like, Engine has his ballerina costume from Tag Team Racing. There's so much of this stuff scattered around, it's fantastic. And now we move on to the time trials. With the exception of people who are god tier good that you face online, this is the biggest challenge this game has to offer. Once you set a fast time on a track, Entropy's Ghost becomes available to challenge. If you beat all of Entropy's Ghost, you unlock him as a character, so it's obviously going to be a major challenge. However, that's only just for beginning. Oxide has set lap times of his own. Beating Trophy's lap times unlocks Oxide's, and you need to be exceptionally good to beat his times. Brace yourself for hours upon hours of tearing your hair out and learning new shortcuts you had no idea existed as you master each and every track. The fastest time you've ever set on a track is also saved, so you can face yourself on top of or instead of Oxide if you like. Beanox, this is a special request and I respect it may be hard to do, but below Oxide's lap times in the time trial menu, could you have the ability to download the ghost of any of your friends who have also set a lap time for that track? That would be an absolutely fantastic way to train against your friend. Also, could you add online leaderboards for time trials and relics? Because that doesn't exist yet, and I know it's something a lot of people would enjoy. I know plenty of people who kept competitively trying to beat the times for relics on the Insane Trilogy. And finally, before we get to the online stuff, let's talk about the battle mode. The battle mode from the original game returns, but with some awesome differences. For one, you don't have to play with friends, you can choose easy, medium or hard AI, which is really cool. Secondly, there are multiple modes. You have Steal the Bacon, where a flag with a picture of bacon will be hidden somewhere on the battle map. You get the flag to bring it to your team base before the other team. The downside to this is the flag seems to spawn in the same exact spot, which makes it really boring really quickly. Beanox, maybe implementing a randomised set of different locations would be good. Capture the flag as you bring the flag of the opposing team back to your base, but your flag must be in your base to do it. As a 1v1 match, it's pretty boring, but when more people join in, it's a lot of fun. Limit Battle is a point-based brawl. Hit your opponent to get a point. Get as many points in the time limit to win. It gets very intense very quickly. It's a lot of fun. Last Kart Driving. Same principle as Limit Battle, but you have a live system instead. Choose a small arena, pick 7 hard AI, and pray you'll survive. It's definitely some of the most intense action you'll find in the game. 
However, Beanox, it would be really cool if you added a stat screen to the end of this, so you could see who attacked whom and how many times. I love that kind of thing, and without it, it's almost kind of like a hollow victory or failure of sorts. And finally, Crystal Grab. You have to grab as many crystals before the time limit runs out. If you get hit by a weapon, you lose three crystals. However, if you get them all, you automatically win. This gets a lot more intense than you'd expect. It's really, really fun. And speaking of crystals, the purple token crystal challenges are also in the other battle arenas that don't make it into adventure mode. Like the other modes, you don't really get anything for doing it, but it's still nice that they included it. They didn't have to, so thank you very much. Alright, now we have to talk about online. This may take some time, and we're already 6,000 words deep into this thing. My brain is really tired, my throat hurts, but persevere we must! The online mode is a lot of fun, but it's not without its problems, currently. As of the day this video goes out, and check the upload date, there are a lot of features missing that will make the experience a hell of a lot better. So let's go through how it all works. I'll warn you right now, I'm going to make a couple of comparisons to Mario Kart 8 here, since their online mode is currently executed better. So you can cross that one off your bingo cards. Hmm, let's see what else is there. The rubber banding that doesn't exist makes this the Dark Souls of Kart Racers. No, it's so hard! Oh my god, it's so nostalgic! Oh, I love the way Kiki drives in this game. She's way better than her brother, Kesh Banana Booty. Grrr, I hate that night oxymoron from the planet Fart Nerva. I'm not giving the game a 5, I'm not giving it a 10, I mentioned the mechanics and the story, really sorry if you're on that row of the bingo card. Team Sonic Racing, am I right? Where are the Bandicoot Podium Girls? They definitely wouldn't be way cooler as racers. Oh wait, they are, yay! Okay, I think I covered everything there. When you go to Matchmaker, you're joined by up to 7 people. There will then be the option to pick one of 3 random tracks, or pick random. This is unfortunately where the problems start. You see, I didn't actually get to the race because it kicked me out of the group. Yeah, as of right now, the servers aren't perfect, but I promise it's going to get better, and it's not actually that common. But anyway, the choice system in this game is a little flawed. In Mario Kart 8, it has the three choices and random, and then it shows what everyone chose and cycles through and picks one of those choices at random. If the random option comes up, it's a random track from the entire track listing, not just those three. In this game, however, it's a vote, the highest vote wins, and the random option is one of three on the list, not the entire track listing. I personally think this is a very flawed system, because there are going to be some tracks you very rarely get to play. I've not once seen Android Alley receive more than two votes, and something else always wins. It's kind of annoying, I really love that track. I think making it similar to how it is in Mario Kart 8 would be more appealing. Now, when it comes to playing online with friends, this too is a little bit bare bones. Whilst you can send an invite to create a private room, the host of that room is the only one who has the option to pick stuff, which is a little limiting to the people you've got with you. But there isn't even an option to create a locked, coded room like the tournaments in Mario Kart 8, or even the rooms in Smash Bros Ultimate. Please add a function to create custom rooms with a code requirement, with the same exact pick one of three tracks or a random track option like the normal online setup. But obviously the random track option allows you to pick a random track from the entire track list like I mentioned before. And whilst I'm at it, have a way for the host to have a full set of options to control. Mirror tracks isn't an option on private or non-private rooms. A separate menu as the host of this room to just change it to mirror would be great. The same with battle mode. To change the battle mode, you have to leave the room and start a new one. Maybe in a private room, you just go to the same menu to switch to the battle mode. Make it so only the host can do it, but that would fix a lot of issues. When you try to do battles online, you don't even choose what type of battle you want. It just lumps one of the battle modes in with one of the arenas. Which isn't great if there's a mode you don't want to play, but just shows up and wins the vote anyway. However, you can choose exactly what you want in a private room with a bunch of features. However, part two, when you lose in the last cart driving mode, you are stuck looking at your own deceased cart until the match is over. Please add a spectator mode for this. It is so boring for the player who's out. Maybe even have a version of the races where you can turn off weapons so it's purely down to racing skill. That can make it really interesting. Maybe even add some cup championships. People love them. Preset or custom built championships for private rooms could be awesome. You could even have a podium section at the end of it, because the races are longer. Maybe you could even have a set option for the number of laps. The list of stuff you could add goes on. 
And I know that this will probably never happen, but because my idea on private rooms would be defined by codes, could console crossplay become a thing? I mean, I'm guessing not due to the loading difference between Switch and PS4 and stuff, but it's just a suggestion. I know that I've just listed a ton of stuff, but I really want to see the online mode get better and better as time goes on, and hopefully some of these will happen. In the online races, there's another issue that pops up a lot, unfortunately, and that is skill level. From what I've heard, there's something hidden going on in the background that pairs you up with people of similar skill, but that doesn't seem to be happening as much at the moment, possibly because the game's too new. When first place finishes a race online, a 30 second countdown commences, giving people a small chance to finish the race. This is so much better than the 20 seconds it originally was. You don't have to wait too long, and it gives people who are having an intense battle a chance to conclude it, though that's not always going to happen. However, I do have a suggestion, and I sort of mentioned this with the battle mode. Once you finish the race, have a spectator mode similar to Formula 1. Switch between camera angles and switch between different races so you can watch the epic racing once you've finished. Having an overhead camera so you can see what's going on with certain people would be really cool, I think. I know I've said a lot of negatives online, and they're not really intended to be negatives, just more, it would be great if you could add this over time. But let me state, the online is fine. It's really fun but it could just be so much more. And that's why I'm bringing it up. Maybe Beanox one day will see this and be like, yeah, okay, we'll consider it. Or maybe they're working on it at the moment as a post-launch update, because those are a thing that's coming and we'll get to that in a bit. Before that though, I want to talk about Wumper Coins. At the end of every offline and online event, you get Wumper Coins, regardless if you win or lose. The amount you get, I will describe in the assumption you win, because it's easier to explain that way. Each track is separated into a tier, which varies in length. The fourth tier being Tiny Arena and Electron Avenue, as those tracks take the longest to complete. Tier 1, tracks like Crash Cove get you 20 coins, Tier 2, 40 coins, Tier 3, 60 coins, and Tier 4, 80 coins. However, Online used to give you double that. It doesn't anymore though, I don't know why that changed. Now, here's where things get complicated. Every 24 hours after you've done one race online, an hour-long timer commences. During this time, your amount times is by 2.5, so tier 1 tracks get 100 coins, tier 2 200 coins, tier 3 300 coins, and tier 4 400 coins if you win. It's also possible that this ends once you've earned over 3000 coins, they take roughly the same amount of time. However, it was double this at one point, so 200 coins is 400, 600, 800. The coin amount seems to be constantly in flux, presumably based on feedback, so I wouldn't be surprised if this changes again in the future. As of right now, this is what it's like. Hopefully it is going to change again to give us more coins. The Pit Stop is a way to purchase characters, costumes, carts, decals for the carts, and more. Characters and costumes are typically 2,500 coins, so if you want them all, it's going to cost a lot. Don't worry though, these are all in-game coins. They've confirmed no microtransactions. However, my gripe with the coins isn't the purchasing option. I mean, sure, you have very limited choice with options which change every 24 hours. It would be nicer if you could just choose what you want from a list, but it doesn't bother me. What does bother me is that you don't get rewarded for doing something cool or really good. Like Oxide's Ghost, for example. I just get the same amount of coins I would elsewhere. So beating Oxide's Ghost on Crash Cove, one of the biggest challenges, only gives me 20 coins. Really? That's pretty silly. I feel like you should either get more or get a massive 5,000 to 10,000 coin payout after beating all of them. All you get is a trophy for bragging rights and an end trophy skin. I love the challenge and I would do it again, but I don't think that that's nearly enough. And also, for some reason, if you're not connected to the internet, even when you're doing an offline race, you don't get coins. That's really silly. But you don't have to be a PlayStation Plus, Xbox Live, or Nintendo Online member to get coins, so that's nice. You just need to be connected. It's still really silly though. However, please Beanox do this, it's a fantastic idea. My friend Laura came up with a really good idea to cater to those who don't have an online subscription like herself. Daily and weekly challenges, similar to that of Rayman Legends. Doing well in a daily challenge could yield up to 1,000 coins, and then the weekly challenge could give more, like 3,000 or something. It's pretty infuriating to unlock things if you don't have a subscription, so that could be a really nice countermeasure for it, and just genuinely really fun. Thank you very much for that, Laura. Finally, let's talk about the future. 
Beanox is releasing free DLC which contains a brand new track, new characters, costumes, mini cart items and mini challenges. However, it's currently unknown how much of this is online related. Hopefully it's none of it for those who don't have online memberships for their respective console. The first, again, free Grand Prix update releases July 3rd and will feature Torna, the four podium girls, plus a brand new track called Twilight Tour. Completely new, not remastered. They've also confirmed that the Spyro Grand Prix is on the horizon and that they're looking into recreating the Crash Tag Team racing tracks. We've not had official confirmation, but from a data mine it seems like there will be a new Grand Prix every month leading up to December, with Spyro's Grand Prix possibly being September. That's absolutely insane, I love you Beanox. I think to conclude, I want to say, Beanox has done a brilliant job so far recreating this masterpiece. They're keeping the content coming for, at the very least, the rest of the year, and they're listening to the fans. Any issue we have may be getting patched or added somewhere down the line. Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled is an absolutely incredible, fun, addicting kart racer. Even though the online mode can be better, the game does not disappoint, and I've put way too much time into this game already. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Currently, the game gets an 8.7 from me, but if they flesh out the online, I'll definitely boost it to a 10. But that's for another time. For now, I'll see you on the racetrack. Driving as the female bandicoots because they are just so badass, I can't wait to race as them. Thank you very much for watching this stupidly long, well over 8,000 word review thesis video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, share the video around. If you'd like to support me and the channel for wasting probably like an hour of your life, I have no idea how long this is, um, I have a Twitch, a Twitter, a Patreon and a donation link in the description. It really helps me out, but seriously, thank you so much for sticking all the way to the end. I really hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you next time. Take care. Bye bye.